Well, welcome everyone to Pentecost today. Larry Sparks here, and I am thrilled. I often come on and do my broadcast interviewing authors who have had new books come out. Well, now it's time for me. I, I have this book that I have been working on now, goodness, I would say for about 22 years, even though I have not been writing it for 22 years, this message has been burning in my spirit for that long, ever since Holy Spirit first touched me. So Pentecostal fire, it is available now. But I want to bring on a few people more than just promoting or talking about a book. I want to bring on what I would call practitioners of Pentecost, people who are not just writing theoretically about the move of the Spirit, but people who are actually experiencing it. So without further ado, I'm bringing on somebody who is not just one of our authors, but truly one of my dearest friends, Emma Stark. Thank you for joining me today. Well, Larry, what an absolute joy. And again, warm greetings from uh, Scotland, from Glasgow in Scotland. And uh, when I said to my family, I'm just going on to record with Larry. You know what the shout in this house was. Oh, he's our favorite American. So my boys are outside the room, my teenagers, uh, oh. celebrating you, Larry. And can we just say, audience, you need to buy this book. Oh, I have uh, read it. I think I've written an endorsement for it. And don't miss this timely message because you need burned alive by the fire of God. Well, and you know what? I will say one of the things about this book that is very relevant to you, Emma, and to the land where you live is you all had invited me to come minister me with you and Simon Breaker in England uh, in November last year. And I, the Lord actually told me, you're going to finish writing this book on trains back and forth from Glasgow to, to Leicester, to England. And I said, well, Lord, why there? And he reminded me, it's the land of revival. Yeah. The United yeah. Kingdom is the land of revival. So much of what we've experienced, I mean, I talk about Pentecostal fire, Azusa Street, but so much of what we've experienced mm -hmm. here in the United States, I'm grateful for my nation. I love my nation, but I honor the Welsh revival. I yeah. honor those from the United Kingdom who exported Pentecostal fire and hunger for Pentecostal fire over here. So I just thought that was so funny that this book, literally the Lord would not let me finish it unless I was on the ground in the United Kingdom. So I, I remember actually you talking about that in your train journeys, London, Scotland, you, you put in a fair few hours on the British transport system, didn't you? <laughs> it was delight. I, I have pictures. I just sat there with my Diet Coke looking out the window and it's stunning. It's beautiful. And it is, it is the land of revival. And I believe the Lord is remembering right now covenants he's made. He is not a nationalistic God, but he is a God who remembers covenants that were made concerning revival, wells of revival, historic places where he's moved in the past. I believe he's moving again, but I yes. don't want to get focused on that. You have a word. You literally just shared this with me before we went live. I want you to speak into this because I can talk about geographies of revival or places where God has moved, and that's all fine and good. But you were talking about the real location of the Holy of Holies. So folks, buckle up. We're, we're not, this is not Harrison Ford, Raiders of the Lost Ark. We're not looking for the glory, for the presence, for the Pentecostal fire in a certain place, location, or geography, although I honor those places. Emma, when you talk about the Holy of Holies, what does that mean and provoke us? Okay, I'm happy to do that. You can just feel as we start, it's like God is just intercepting, Larry, before I answer your question. You can feel the desperation in the heart of God to send forth his power, to send forth his burning, to send forth his presence again. It's like this desperation where God is, I actually could feel like almost, I'm struggling to catch my breath because of the urgency and the desire of God. God is not a withholding God. He's not an aloof God. He wants to burn you alive with his power and with his presence right now. Whew, you can feel that, Larry, as we begin. You see, if I say to you, friends, where's the presence of God? I mean, where is it? Where's the presence of God right now? You've got to know it is 
not in a building. It's not dangling in the atmosphere. It's not at the front of a church. The presence of God is in you. You have become, by the virtue of the cross and the indwelling spirit, the most sacred space. And Paul is clear, your body is the temple of the Spirit of God. Your physical frame is the dwelling place of the Holy of Holies. Your physical frame is the dwelling place of God on the earth. Your flesh is the most sacred Holy Spirit space in which the king of kings and the lord of lords of the universe resides under your skin is the full force of the righteousness of god you are the temple of god and i actually feel like larry as we just say that you know we have pushed that understanding away we have really shoved that to one side and we have old testament nonsense thinking oh you know i've got to run to the church building or oh i've got to dress up to meet god or i've got to go to church as my prime way to meet god like god has a house no you are his house and god is saying i want you to be burnt alive but you've got to stop your thinking where one day or someday in a house in a physical building it's going to happen and God says no I'm already the indwelling spirit and when you come in to know that when that blows through your mind I will burn you alive as you are where you are where I find you however you are because I'm wanting to be let loose inside you where I already live who <laughs> Well, you know, as, as you're saying that, and this is, there is a presence of the Lord here. I had to like move my little camera stuff around, but I, I, I feel like one of the reasons we don't see this thing called revival. And I, I just as a parenthetical, cause you and I have a very similar perspective on this. Part of me loves the word revival because I studied revival and I've seen in times past what a landscape changing move of God looks like in history. Once again, British Isles know a landscape changing move of the spirit. At the same time, I don't like revival because of how we've redefined it in the 21st century. And Emma, what you're saying right now is so speaking to something. For those of you watching, you, you this is going to sound weird. I actually feel like in the in the pit of your stomach, in your gut, you're going to feel burning. It's going to be like there's a river coming out of you because what Emma's speaking is literally speaking to and provoking the spirit of God that lives inside of you. Where sometimes, why get aggravated about revival? We're waiting for something or someone who's already here. I think that's it, Larry. And I think there is this sense of, uh, first of all, misunderstanding of where God lives. That's the first thing I want to kill, the misunderstanding of where God lives. He doesn't live in church. He lives in you. And, and that will change your whole world. So we're not waiting for God to walk into a building. God is waiting for us to say yes, that he might explode out of us where he already lives. You see, he is so determined to burn you alive. He's so determined that you're going to be a worker of miracle signs and wonders. He's so determined that you're going to be a glory carrier. He's so going to He's so determined that you're going to turn the world upside down. He's so determined that you are where he wants to be. And so I think the second lie is Oh, you know, I'm not worthy. You have got to get rid of your shame. You have got to push off that sense of I'm not really deserving. You are made righteous and made deserving. And I don't think we have even begun to grasp the purpose of what the cross did where you became the dwelling place of divine holiness. 
he resides in you. And I think you're right, Larry, in that misunderstanding of revival where I'm waiting for God to suddenly drop down here and, and do something sovereign in a building where he's saying, let me use you, let me use you, let me have you, let me take over all that you are. And here is the thing. God only burns on an altar where there's sacrifice. If there's no sacrifice, there's no fire. And so God is saying, I can't burn where there's no fresh sacrifice because there's nothing to burn. So he's saying, will you sacrifice your time? Will you sacrifice your money? Will you sacrifice your life of flesh? This is not devotion. This is not passion. This is not even some kind of like exuberant worship. He's saying, cry to me in a surrendered, sacrificial way. Give me your time. Give me your life. Give me your attention. Give Give me your wealth, give me your possessions, because as we start to do that exchange where I sacrifice, he says, I'm just going to explode my burning all over you and it'll be on you, not on a piece of carpet somewhere. Well, as you're saying that, Emma, you know, one of the, the uh, we're pushing for something right now. We got to push past this old covenant, old yeah. Testament perspective, because Romans 12, one says this. He is looking for living sacrifices, living. Yes. Sac He's not looking for dead people in the sense that physically dead people. He needs living people who offer up everything. And Emma, what you were just talking about in terms of some people believing this lie, I'm not worthy to carry the presence of God. Well, we really need to get over that. We really need to have a higher view of the blood of Jesus because yes, in theory, apart from the blood of Jesus, none of us is worthy. We know that's, that's a yeah. given. But because his blood has been sprinkled, I'm grateful I get to go to heaven. But Emma, what you're saying, we need to have a higher view that the blood of Jesus has cleansed us of sin. Why? Because he's establishing a new holy of holies in the earth realm. Yeah. And it's us. It's us. I think, Larry, this is so important. You know, that beautiful scripture, you know, therefore, in view of God's mercy, yeah. offer your bodies as living sacrifices. This is your holy and acceptable form of worship. People watching right now, I want to tell you this. God is saying, you are where my burning will fall. You are it. You are where my eruption of glory will happen in you, through you, on your life, I will burn. But here is the proviso. It's not about being worthy because you're already worthy. It's not about being educated. It's nothing to do with that. It is this proviso that I come and I sacrifice all that I am. That his burning is not just contained in me, but his burning has all of me. And I do feel like in this season in the earth, God is saying to you, I'm cleaning my house. I want fire on the altar. We've not kept the fire kindled because there was no new fresh sacrifice. You can't have fire without sacrifice. So come back and lay your lives down again come back and give me everything and i really feel it's quite personal it's about time it's about money it's about energy and i think larry you know as a church leader it's really difficult to put anything on weekly these days. Nobody wants anything weekly. You know, we're all too busy for weekly. Nobody wants a weekly prayer meeting or a weekly home group. We just about manage a weekly Sunday service, don't we? Yeah. And I actually feel like God is calling us back into, no, 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 no. you got to put yourself on the altar in weekly prayer meetings. you got to give on a weekly basis. You've got to come together in 
this frequency of sacrifice of time and money and sacrifice uh, together that I might burn you. It's this sense of this consistency of giving our lives back to God. Larry, I really believe God is saying, come on, back to the basics of consistence of giving our bodies as living sacrifices. That means my time in prayer, my time in gathering. And, and I want to say it again, it's about sacrificial giving. And God say, watch me burn that frequency of you sacrificing all that you are. Can I propose one other thing that either, as you're talking about, as we offer up everything to God, as we yeah. offer up, you're, you're talking about, you, we haven't maybe seen fresh fire because we haven't offered a fresh sacrifice. And you That's know, the it. Lord was highlighting That's as you said that, because there's so many things that we think about sacrifice and we think about our time. You're talking about that finances. We think yeah. about uh, laying sin or struggle or addiction. Absolutely. Yes. We give all that to God. Yeah. But one of the things the Holy Spirit was highlighting is maybe the old ways of doing ministry, old ways of doing church, old ways, old thought patterns where we thought, well, this worked for 20 years. This worked and it produced a revival 15 years ago. But I, I yeah. feel like, and I'm trying to get the right language out. One of the things he's looking for us to sacrifice is maybe our dependency on previous systems or structures where once again, we pioneer with the Holy Spirit and say, God, like Abraham, I may not know where I'm going, but I'm going to follow you. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I really feel like God has burdened me afresh with rhythms of outlandish commitment to prayer. Yeah. And I don't mean the sense of I go and I sit in a service and I listen to a preacher. I mean, we need that to nourish us. Or I go and I listen to a prophet and you need that for direction. Or I go and I just uh, worship and I sing somebody else's songs. And actually you need that because you need people to help put truth in your mouth. And I really feel like the Lord is calling us again into this collective inclusiveness where my sacrifice before him is, is contending prayer on mass yeah. this sacrifice of my time to contend yeah. and that sense of for me it's contending for scotland as my prime place of responsibility yes but i have to contend that there would be saving faith that goes out into the atmosphere i have to contend for the harvest I have to contend for his presence. And he's saying, don't you see that when you sacrifice your time and you travail together, that's a sacrifice that I can burn. And when you add into that the sacrifice of your tithes and offerings, I can burn that. And I just think that God is saying, what can I burn? What can I burn? Where can I burn? And of course, as we've already said, it's not the building. And it, it's the sense of the hovering cloud. You know, that's a very Old Testament concept. You're not really looking for that. You're looking for where God's saying, where can I burn? And really what he's saying is, who can I burn? Who is sacrificially living that I can burn you? It's, it's actually quite complicated. It's not, it's, it's actually quite simple. It's not complicated. He burns sacrifice. So therefore you have to sacrifice. Yeah. You know, and I think one of the dangers, and I, I share about this in the book, one of the dangers that prevents us from experiencing revival is this idea. It's coming one day, someday. And yeah. could it be, could it be that we have the ability to bring that someday into now. Yes. Through, cont I love that you use the phrase contending prayer because one yes. of the things the Lord told me, I'll just say this, I was in Missouri this week for some TV shows. I went into the little makeup room. We're both familiar with it. And the Lord yes. confronted me. Now, you and I can have a mature conversation about this because I know we believe in the new thing and new means new and we've heard new era, new season. But one yes. of the things the Lord spoke to my heart, he said, 
where's the old fire? Uh, I, we, we, I'm all about new it's, ways of partnering with God, but I felt like he was saying, where is that old Holy Ghost fire? And, and he contrasted that with what we see in the scriptures where they tried to put the Ark of the Covenant on a new cart yes. and a guy touched it and died. Yeah. Where I think sometimes what we try to do is innovate past God's will. Yeah. We think yeah. we got to make this more appealing or cool or relevant. We're living in the 21st century. How can we bring in teenagers and all that? But what I love that you're talking about, and I talk about it in the book, we need yeah. the old ways, the ancient paths, the ancient yeah. boundary stones. We need contending prayer. They used to call it travail or tarrying or grabbing the horns of the altar. It's basically people who said, God, you can burn through me. Yeah, I, I think really when we talk about glory to glory and an increase of the glory of God coming to us, which there absolutely is, or a move of God revival, pick your favorite language in how to express that. I think we, we understand that we can't carry weight without foundations. Mm. You can't carry increased glory without foundations. And the foundations come in the quality of your character. I don't think God can trust fresh fire, Pentecostal fire, however you best express it. I don't think he can trust that weight on something that is flimsy of stature and flimsy of character. Otherwise, you will be consumed. So I really feel like God says, if you can sacrifice, you can prove yourself worthy to carry something of the new glory and of the ancient fire. And I really feel like the question of today to those who are listening and those who are reading your book is this. How could I sacrifice? How could I sacrifice to be proved worthy to carry the burning of God? Yeah. And I really believe that's the question of the, the art. Do not mix up sacrifice with enthusiasm. Mm. Do not mix up sacrifice with passion or devotion. And I really feel like we're in those days where David says, I will not give to God something that did not cost me. You want the glory, it will cost you. You want the fire, it will cost you. You want to carry the new, it will cost you. You want to carry the ancient of days, it will cost you. And actually, there is this sense right now where God is asking you, where can you pay a price? This will not happen without cost. And you need to become an example of cost paying. You need to become an example of sacrificial living. What kind of person do you want to be? Do you want to be a fire carrying glory filled person? To carry power, to carry fire, to carry the new, to carry the ancient, you must come to fresh, fresh sacrifice. Well, as, as we finish up, Emma, I, I just want you to pray into that. I really do. I feel like that is going to be the thing. Listen, please. I, I feel the presence of the Lord all over this time together. John Kilpatrick, who knows a bit about revival, who's the pastor of the Brownsville Revival from 1995 to 2000, he said this, revival never goes on sale. The price Ooh. always is the same. I love and I, that. And I really believe that experiencing the glory, the fire, the new and the ancient. God is not, there's listen, there's not seven steps or three keys. 
If somebody tries to give you that, they're offering you a cheap substitute. I do believe it is one thing, though. And Emma, it's beautiful that you just took us there because that's just something that I burn for is it is that Romans 12 one. We offer up our bodies yeah. as living sacrifices for wow the fire of god to consume and can i just say larry this is not about a work ethic i think no. that's the mix mix up in our brains isn't it well it's not god saying work harder it, it's not, and i think in our western culture we think well oh, d do more do more do more work harder no 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 it's not the cost of driving yourself into the ground and being exhausted Okay, it, 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 tear that nonsense up. It, it is that sense of it costs me, but it costs me in a certain way that will refine my character, not just wear me out. Yeah. So my character gets refined because I give to god i don't indulge myself yeah and i release that ability to you right now oh right now over these airwaves youtube facebook wherever you are i release that ability come on come on come on i raise my hands to you and i release that ability oh that you may be one who right now enters in to bringing a fresh sacrifice oh let every other idol fall in your life let every other desire come to nothing apart from the desire to sacrifice all for your king to give him to give him your life your tithes your time your energy, your words, your prayers afresh. Let your life right now, I lose it to you, become alive for the altar so that the fire has somewhere to fall. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. And right now, just as we finish, Emma, this weekend, even in a service with Tommy and Miriam, we were praying into this very thing. And it, it, Emma's absolutely right. We're not asking to work harder. And I specifically feel for those of you who are dealing with sin, bondage, addiction, things that you have tried every which way to break off. We believe in deliverance. We believe in warfare. I believe sometimes, sometimes what breaks some of those things is offering them up to the Lord. That's the starting place. Let's just say that for those of you who feel like I'm not worthy to be holy of holies, Larry, I know I'm born again, but I know I'm saved but you, you don't know what I'm struggling with or dealing with. You know, God does. And his invitation, his summons to you is offer it up to him. Yes. He's not going to come and smite you. He's yes. not going to come and destroy you, but he does want to send his fire upon you. In fact, even right now, I've, I've, I believe that fire of deliverance is falling on some people because this is the first time where you've actually felt a release to say, you know what? God, I, I'm going to offer up all of my struggle. I'm going to offer up the things that I can't fix. I know it's wrong. I know the Bible says what it does, but God, I offer it up to you right now. And I ask for your delivering fire and power to fall on me. Emma, would you just finish that? Because you have such a grace for that. But I feel like there will be deliverance yeah, in the fire. Yeah, absolutely. It, sometimes I think we go, oh, I've confessed this sin a hundred times. And maybe we have, you know, I can I confess this brokenness right now. Whatever is a bondage or a hindrance to you, I list the burning, consuming fire of God to burn it up and incinerate it and remove it from you. And any demon that is tied to you, that has got you in repetitive cycles, that is a stumbling block to you, that seems to own you more than the power of God, I release the burning fire fire of God so that thing now is cut from you in Jesus name and that the fire of God doesn't just liberate you it consumes you with glory as well it's the fire of purification and it's the fire of consecration right now in Jesus name Whew. yep Whew. yep that's it and even as that fire falls on you the Lord's saying I'm giving you a new taste I'm actually taking the taste of sin away as you experience my fire, my presence, and you will truly taste and see that the Lord is good. You're going to taste and see that God is superior to the sin 
and to the bondage. So, Father, we thank you for that. And I, do, I thank you that on the other side of sacrifice, we're not doing it out of religiosity or trying to be pious. We're not doing it to work harder, God. We offer up our lives, God, because you send fire. <laughs> you send fire. You, you send yourself. You manifest yourself. And I'm so grateful that we don't need to go to a building or to a location or geography. We honor those places. I love those places. But God, I thank you that we are the holy of holies, God. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your fire. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 It's, it's hard to land a plane after that because it's a presence of God on it. It's the urgency of God. And I have to say, I felt like I smacked into that yeah. and knew just as we started broadcasting, like God's really like, I want this. Yeah. And I think we've been the ones who think, well, we desire this and not realize mm. God is so desiring of this. Mm. Heaven is so ready. Yeah. Yeah. Heaven is ready. Even the language that is describing the Holy Spirit is the spirit of burning. Yeah. It's almost like, Emma, I feel like in this broadcast, we somehow, whoa, I feel like we touch the spirit of burning. Yeah. We've touched, we've, we've yeah. felt yeah. his burning, his consuming desire for you, yeah. for those of you who are watching, to manifest himself yeah. through you. So, yeah. yeah, as we finish up, it was funny, Emma, we, this weekend we were singing that old vineyard song, uh, send, send your power, show your power, oh, Lord, our oh, God. Oh, I love that song. <laughs> and it was beautiful because I actually felt like the Lord said, just have one singer up there, have her sing it and prophesy it over the people. And then the Lord said, okay, where are you expecting my power to come from? Isn't that interesting? Because it, uh, I think we might be prophetic, Larry, because sometimes I felt like in recent years to sing, show your power or that song, show your glory. There was like an arrogance to it, you know, oh, show it to me, God. But I felt a complete overturning of that. Yeah. And even this weekend in my own church, I felt the need just to say, show your glory, yeah. show your glory. And it wasn't with that mm. arrogant that I might look good or for my fame. You know, it was that sense of God, you've got to show your glory because because we now need your fame and and the transformation that only you can bring. Show your glory. Show your power. Mm. Yes. Show your might. And you know what? That that we'd be a people. I remember you prophesying this a couple of years ago that we'd be a people on our knees. Yeah. It's going to be this this face down era where, like you're saying. We're not saying show your power, show your glory so we can look good. We're not going to look good. Yes. I, I, I'm going to tell the folks watching right now, we cry that out and he comes, we feel him, but it, we, we are not going to be able to look spectacular in that we are going to be face down on our knees. I even believe entire worship teams are going to be leading on the floor, yes. Yes. not looking dignified because when he does show his power and glory, that's the only state we can operate in. It's this movement of the entire body of Christ who are the remnant into authenticity. Mm. I think that's what really is. We're talking about here. Um, I mean, we've often talked about the end of the polished performance. Yeah. Um, and actually just it's raw, authentic heart cry. Yes. If you don't come, God, we're lost. Yeah. 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 Well, goodness, we could keep going, but that's how you know that Holy Spirit has a wonderful synergy here. So again, Emma, thank you so much. Thank you for being such a key voice in my life. I mean, the Pentecostal fire book and teaching is something that is really the culmination of me spending time around a lot of people who are practitioners of this. Yeah. And yeah. you, the team in Glasgow, I am so grateful for what you're pressing in for. And you are seeing that fire and we are yeah. seeing increasing yeah. measures of that. Yeah. So. Yes. And the book, oh, can we just have a, a, a comment on it is 
timely. Oh, okay. It is timely. So make sure you own a copy. It's one of those books that you'll want to underline and highlight. And then at least buy two, because if you want to give one to a friend and it's that sense of you, we want to come back to the conversation of the need for fire yeah. and actually probably you should be reading it in a small group where you're chatting back and forward about the value of the fire of God. It's not one of those books you go, I, I read it and I set it down and it wasn't that a lovely thought. It's that sense of, you know, actually buying a group of them and we chew together the concepts in it. That's probably the best way to use this book. Well, let it be. That is my prayer for this, that you would read it because listen, I'm not an expert. I have, yes, I have credentials. Yes, I have my master's. Yes, I've studied church history. But I'll tell you the greatest credential that I have to write this book, it's the same credential that you have when you read it. I'm hungry. Yeah, I'm hungry. I it's pray that we would yeah. all be equally provoked to say, God, we want the fire of old. Why? So that we can be catapulted into the new. Yeah. I want the fire of Pentecost so that I can actually start to touch and taste what Jesus called the greater things. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. blessings to you all who are watching. Emma Stark, please go visit her. You know, I mean, I'm sure there are many fans of Power Hour or Par R. Par R. She just says it so much better on YouTube, Facebook. Uh, yeah. She's written two of the most amazing books, Lion Bites and The Prophetic Warrior. I know she's on here talking about my book, but I'm just so grateful for the impact Emma Stark has had, continues to have, and the amazing growing work that God is establishing in the British Isles. It is, um, it is incredible. So thank you all for watching today, and we look forward to talking to you real soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.